<laughs> Hi everyone, welcome to MIAC's Artist and Scholar Dialogue series where MIAC staff and curators will be speaking with different artists, archaeologists, and anthropologists about their work, the impact the pandemic has had on their research, and just what they've been up to in the past several months. Um, my name is Lilia McEnany, I am a curatorial assistant at the museum, and today we'll be um, speaking with Dr. Scott Bortman, who is an associate professor of anthropology at the University of Colorado Boulder. Dr. Orman is also the co-curator of the book, Painted Reflections, Isometric Design and Ancestral Pueblo Pottery, published by the Museums of New Mexico Press in 2018 with Dr. Joe Traugott. Painted Reflections is the basis for an exhibition that will open at MIAC um, in the coming year. But before we start talking with Dr. Ortman, I'd like to briefly acknowledge the place where this conversation is happening, at least on my end, and Dr. Ortman's too, is, um, in Ogopoge within the table world. Um, as a non-native person living in so-called Santa Fe, I'm a guest in the ancestral homelands of the table people, and I wish to acknowledge the native people past, present, and future who walk or will walk on these lands. Um, so to begin, um, I'd like to, hi, Dr. Orman, thank you for um, taking the time to chat. Um, hi. To begin, for those of you who might not know your work, um, maybe we can start with a brief introduction, who you are, where you work, what you work on, and who you work with. Okay. Uh, as you mentioned before, I'm, an, I'm a professor in the anthropology department at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, I've worked for many years with, uh, with Pueblo people in the Southwest, uh, working on uh, the archeological perspective on Pueblo history. Um, for the last six years, my work is focused especially uh, with the Pueblo of Pewaukee, where I've been uh, investigating ancestral sites uh, on Pewaukee land and right next to Pewaukee land uh, with uh, tribal youth, community members, and elders from other Teva villages. Uh, I've been, before I came to CU, I worked for many years at a place called Crow Canyon Archaeological Center in Cortez, Colorado, where I uh, did research on uh, even older ancestral sites of the Four Corners area before my work sort of started migrating, so to speak, down here toward the Santa Fe area uh, where it focuses today. Great. Um, so you're working in the Santa Fe area now. Um, so how has the, imp the pandemic impacted your archaeological research in this area right now? Well, it's definitely had a big impact on field work. Um, you know, for several years, I uh, have run a summer field program that, uh, you know, brought together students from CU Boulder with, uh, with students from the Pueblo of Pewaukee and other, and other elders. Uh, you know, that would be a group of 20 to 30 people, you know, working together during the day. Uh, and uh, that obviously hasn't been feasible, you know, as, Last March, I, when uh, the pandemic first hit, um, I thought, well, you know, my, my schedule for the summer field work was in July, and I thought, oh, well, you know, there's plenty of time for us to get over this <laughs> between March and July. <laughs> and then, you know, it got to be June, and it was like, oh, okay, well, maybe we're not going to be through this. So, you know, it went from a program involving students and undergraduates and graduate students and folks from the villages to just some graduate students and me, to just me and one other person, to not being able to do it. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I tried to hold out as long as I could, but it just wasn't going to happen. Um, one of the, we, as part of the work I'm doing, um, we have several collections on loan from museums in the area, including from IAC, uh, for which I'm grateful, of course. And, uh, some students and I were working with those materials uh, when the pandemic hit, and that was also interrupted in the sense that the buildings closed so that we weren't able to go and work with the material in the buildings. Um, so, you know, the field work and laboratory work aspects of archaeology have been sort of ground to a halt um, because of this. The 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 maybe, you know, I don't know. I I like to look for silver linings and things. So uh, one silver lining of it was that because my normal travel as a professor went way down, you know, not going to meetings and conferences and things like that, uh, 
I found I actually had a lot more time than I thought I was going to have this spring and summer to work on uh, writing projects. So um, that aspect of my research, you know, has gone just fine. Um, you know, in some ways, again, having, in a sense, having our lives get simplified has made it easier to sit down and focus on writing. Of course, if, you know, if all we ever got to do was write, write before too long, it would get pretty stale. <laughs> uh, you know, there's, I think any good archaeologist has a lot more that they want to write about based on their experiences than they've had time to do so far. And so it's, you know, it's been nice to have that opportunity. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's been next. I mean, we, I've certainly been busy, but the way in which I've been busy has changed obviously way beyond what I had planned. That makes a lot of sense. Um, what have you been writing about? Just writing up the Pawaki? project? Yeah, um, you know, so I, I um, my, my work actually has sort of two strands to it. Um, so one strand is very much local and community-based and interested in the histories of specific communities and, uh, you know, uh, the details of the cultures of a time and a place and so forth. Um, and another thread of my work is much more broad, um, comparative, uh, much more sort of extra abstract and almost sort of macroeconomic um, in thinking about, uh, you know, factors that make a difference in, in the way that human societies provide for human needs. And that kind of work has um, emphasized working with existing information collected by archaeologists over the years. And so that work has continued really unchanged uh, with the pandemic. And so I had a few projects that had gotten started um, thinking along those lines that uh, we had an opportunity to finish this spring uh, because of this. So for example, um, a group of us produced a paper on uh, ancient Maya cities and how they're similar to or different from uh, contemporary urban areas. And uh, we were able to finish that paper and it's gonna come out in Latin American antiquity soon. Um, I, uh, I've been collaborating with some experts that work uh, in Angkor in Southeast Asia on a project um, involving uh, the farming systems of that society and how, uh, how they were able to feed this huge population in this gigantic ancient city, you know, using the landscape surrounding Angkor. So, you know, those kinds of projects uh, have continued and I've been writing about all of those. Um, starting in September, uh, I actually took up residency at the School for Advanced Research here in Santa Fe. Um, I'm gonna be here through this coming year. And uh, my goal while I'm here is to work on a book uh, uh, with people from the Pueblo Pewaukee on the things we've been doing together. Uh, I actually gave a, a talk about the ideas for the book uh, through the SAR uh, Scholar Colloquium series, and you can find it on YouTube today <laughs> if you'd like to learn more about that. But uh, this year, that's my main writing project will be the, uh, a book that I discussed in that talk. Okay. So, I mean, building off of that, how do you envision your work with communities looking like in during your fellowship year and as you're finalizing this mm -hmm. book? Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, it, there's going to be good opportunities to meet with, you know, one or two people at a time uh, from the Pueblo. Uh, and, you know, I found over the years that the best place to get together and to discuss these sorts of things is at ancestral sites themselves. And they are outdoors and there's lots of fresh air. And, you know, so as long as uh, the weather uh, is amenable to it, um, you know, I'm sort of envisioning uh, setting up meetings with, uh, you know, one or a couple uh, tribal members to just walk around some ancestral sites and talk about the things that I think we've learned from an archaeology perspective, talk about what seems important to community members about that, uh, and sort of try to shape that into uh, things that I would write, but also statements that tribal members uh, might contribute or voices they might contribute to the book too. So I think that kind of work will be able to continue. Um, you know, one of the also kind of amazing things that's been happening is uh, I've attended a couple of tribal council meetings via Zoom, uh, you know, so 
uh, you know, the, the, the Pueblo communities are, are with it, <laughs> you know, just like the rest of us, uh, they're doing their business in the way that works best with the technology that we have. Um, and uh, so that's able to move forward. Um, what will, what, probably I can have a small group of a couple people uh, doing some additional documentation of ancestral sites this year, uh, you know, doing that kind of work will, will probably be okay. Um, um, one of the challenges uh, of coming to New Mexico to do field work was the travel restrictions that were in place uh, until just recently. Um, now, if you're coming from out of state, if you can get a negative COVID-19 test before entering New Mexico, you don't have to quarantine. And so that makes it feasible for, for me to do a little bit of field work with small groups where, um, where the landowners are uh, amenable to it. Um, so that kind of work will happen. Um, it's gonna be hard to do additional laboratory work, um, things like that. Certainly plenty of work analyzing the information that we already have. Uh, that's you know, all you need is a computer in a quiet place. So um, I can do that. Uh, so that's, that's what it'll be like. Yeah, yeah. What about the collections work? Is that something that you're just kind of putting on hold? Well, um, one of the things I would like to do while I'm here in Santa Fe is um, do a little bit of work with the collections in the uh, American Indian Research Center or Indian Arts Research Center, excuse me, at uh, SAR. They have a really fine collection of uh, Tewa pottery from the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, um, which is relevant for a portion of the work that we've been doing together. Uh, so uh, I believe SAR has some, some protocols in place, although I'm not, you know, I, I, probably some of them are just to be worked out still, but. I am hoping that um, I'll be able to spend some time in the collections uh, uh, learning a few things from the vessels there. Uh, but, um, you know, like I have a PhD student whose dissertation involves um, doing uh, chemical compositional analysis of potsherds and uh, collecting ancient DNA from uh, dog remains, you know, dog remains and things like that. and. That's been really hard, I mean, in a couple of ways. I mean, one is that for destructive analysis, it's appropriate for uh, descendant tribes to give permission for that work to happen. But because tribal communities vary so much in whether they're meeting and what kind of business they're getting done, it's made it much harder for the museums to do their normal approval process for things. So that's slowed it down. Uh, and then there's just the actual ability to go into the stat, you know, into the collections and put your hands in boxes and get stuff, you know, um, where, um, you know, that's been a real, uh, something that really shut down. I'm encouraged by the, you know, as we've learned more about the, the, the virus, you know, I'm encouraged by the realization that um, it's not passed as easily through contact with surfaces. Um, you know, that's kind of good news. I think I saw someone that explained that, you know, for the density of virus that was used in some of those early studies to get there, someone would have to be actively coughing on a table, <laughs> you know, for like an hour or something like that. But, and then someone would have to come by five minutes later and touch it, you know. And so I think that it seems to me that if, if uh, we all wear masks and start from, with a clean space, that hopefully there's an opportunity for collections-based work to start up again, uh, even if we're not through the pandemic yet. Um, it seems like Again, as we learn, people are trying to figure out ways to keep things going. So I'm hoping that will happen. Yeah. Uh, those aren't my decisions and they're not my responsibility. So I'll leave it to the experts to figure it out. Um, yeah, because I mean, archeology span isn't just about being in the field. It's about collections and it's about collaborating not only in the field and at ancestral sites, but also with items um, and yeah. museum collections. And you can't do the work without doing that. No, oh, and for sure. And, you know, I mean, one of the things that I think is super, super important is um, there are so many collections from past excavations and ancestral sites that have still not been thoroughly studied in a, a modern way. You know, as the methodologies and techniques of archaeology continue to expand and improve um, over time, there are new things one can do with existing collections that help you learn new things that we didn't know in previously without doing additional disturbance to ancestral sites. Uh, 
Um, and, uh, you know, there's just, there's so much opportunity for that uh, to keep archeologists busy for a long time. Um, you know, in many ways, I would say some of the most, one area where there has been tremendous creativity in uh, the practice of archeology span in Northern New Mexico in the past couple of decades has been as archeologists have taken tribal concerns regarding preservation or lack of disturbance of ancestral sites to heart and try to think more about how to learn new things from these places without damaging them. Um, and uh, lots of creative and wonderful ideas. Uh, you know, I mean, I can just give one example. One of my students, uh, uh, Caitlin Davis, is doing her dissertation on the uh, history of Pueblo farming practices. And her project involved using a core sampler to collect pollen and phytolith samples from field areas at a bunch of ancestral sites. You know, the core samplers, you know, that big across. So it makes a, a column like that. You can sample as many fields as you have time to do, and it removes a small section that is not even visible from the surface and doesn't pick up any uh, artifacts or anything like that. Um, and so, Imagine if you were trying to get those samples through an excavation process, you would have to be digging the hell out of that place and really, you know, you know, really, dig, you know, removing a lot of it to be able to get those samples. And the core sampler does, in a way, it collects it more systematically, faster, cheaper, uh, with less impact. Um, and that's just one example. I mean, I sort of dream of the day when Archaeologists will be able to use a core sampler to collect uh, ancient DNA from everyone who walked on the surface of an ancestral house, for example, without doing excavation at all. You know, I think those opportunities are there. I think I think the potential is there for uh, I don't know ground penetrating, you know, remote sensing tools and things like that that show you so much of what's beneath the ground without having to disturb it. Um, and all of these techniques are getting cheaper all the time, so. I just think there's so much opportunity for archaeologists to continue to learn exciting new things without uh, disturbing these places. Um, and you know, I guess I would say, I mean, the archaeological record is still, you know, in a process of decomposition. So it's 500 years from now, there will be less of the ancestral record than there is today. Uh, but you know, so. You know, in many ancestral sites, there might be one particular spot that's eroding away. Well, you know, maybe it's maybe at some point um, the the you know the way if there's excavations that are done in these sites, they'll be done in these areas that are that are in the process of going away anyway, so that the process of excavation will actually add knowledge to the archaeological record rather than removing it. Right. Um, and um, you know, so I don't know. I just uh, I've been I've been following my stream of consciousness here, but uh, I think I think there's lots of lots of great opportunities uh, and creative ideas going on in the field right now about alternative ways to learn things uh, without. Yes. And I feel like a lot of um, that innovation was driven by indigenous archaeologists like Woody, you know, who didn't excavate at all for his dissertation, which is kind of unheard of, right? And it's just really exciting to see. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say it's un I wouldn't say it's unheard of nowadays because you know there are many student dissertation projects do not involve their own excavation project, for example. Okay. Um, but you know, the other point that is important is is that um, the cultural resource management laws and industry that we have is there, and uh, excavation of ancestral sites that are going to be destroyed by development is going to continue. And so, you know, it is important for archaeologists of the future to know how to do that well. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but I do, I do think to the extent that all of us can be mindful about the goals of the work, what one intends to learn relative to what happens to the places. Um, uh, and, and the more archaeologists, well, first of all, the more Native people are archaeologists themselves and who intrinsically incorporate their thoughts into the way that process is done. And then the more non-native archeologists incorporate their the understanding of these things that you gain from having relationships with tribal members. Uh, you know, I, I, hope the, I hope that the overall practice of archeology span will become uh, 
more consistent with tribal values or will be viewed in a more positive light by uh, tribal communities. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so shifting gears a little bit, I know a lot of your other work also tries to think about how archaeology can fit into this larger social science framework, right? Um, so how has the pandemic shaped or reshaped your approach to and maybe um, perspectives on anthropology and archaeology more broadly? Has it caused you to think about the field in a different way at all? In some ways, yeah. Um, you know, 2020 has been an amazing year in the sense that um, I think all of us have felt the stresses and strains pushing on society as we know it uh, in a way that few of us have experienced previously in our lives, no matter how old we are, actually. I mean, my parents are in their mid seventies and they say the same thing as me, you know, <laughs> and I'm a generation younger and you'd probably say the same thing for your life, you yeah. know? So, this is an amazing moment. And I think it's a moment where all of us are newly aware of the vulnerabilities that every society actually faces all the time. And, you know, as an archeologist, all you have to do is look around to notice that every single archeological site is a place that people once lived in that they don't anymore. Well, why is that, you know? <laughs> I mean, all of the, all of the classic ancient civilizations of the world that uh, school children learn about in social studies are ruins now. <laughs> I mean, maybe, exception of Rome, where there's a city among the ruins, you know, or Athens, you know, like that, you know, but, um, you know, the, the most important places of those cities in the past are ruins now. Um, so I think, um, you know, there, I think there, it, we're in a moment where it's really, many people are sort of looking to the bigger picture regarding the situation we find ourselves in. And, um, Archaeology has the potential to tell us a lot about that, you know, about uh, other societies that have faced stresses and strains in the past, uh, you know, what were they like? Uh, how much can societies take? Uh, you know, how close are we to the edge? Um, what are ideas other societies have had for confronting similar challenges to, uh, or what strategies have been, uh, how have they responded, you know, in the sort of aggregate social behavior to the challenges that, um, that we face. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, archaeo the archaeological record is the most extensive compendium of human experience that we have. It's broader than any history book. It's broader than any living person's living memory. It's, bro it's broader than the traditional knowledge of any tribal group to eat too. I mean, it's, it's, it's not all the details, of course, but it's a broad brush perspective on all of it, um, with the exception of what's been eroded away and not preserved. Um, and so we should be learning all we can from that to help us, um, whether, whether the uh, stresses we're dealing with right now and to help us um, build a future that uh, you know, we'll all be proud of. Um, and that our children will thank us for, our grandchildren will thank us for. <laughs> um, you know, uh, Pueblo people look to their ancestors with such respect and reverence for the things that they accomplished and learned how to do. Um, I think all of us should want our descendants to do the same thing. You know, they learn about our actions and what we do and what we will have done in life. Um, so yeah, archeology span should be a part of that. Absolutely. And I've seen even a lot of popular discussion about what the archaeology of the present moment is going to look like a um, hundred years in the future, you know, um, and the anthropology of masks and all of that kind of stuff is really, um, I think it's going to change the way that people look at archaeology as a field more broadly. I mean, I've seen that kind of, those kind of conversations outside of academic realms. Um, which I found really interesting. Yeah, your, your comment reminded me of a study that came out not too long ago where uh, folks studied some ice cores in Greenland and they looked at the levels of lead pollution per year in the laminae of the ice core, you know, and they found a spike of lead pollution during the heyday of the Roman Empire, you know, and much less before and after. Uh, so I'm just imagining like the residues of jet fuel <laughs> in some 
future <laughs> ice core showing like a sudden gap <laughs> in 2020, you know? Right, right. <laughs> yeah. You know, to the extent that we're in the Anthropocene, I mean, you know, it's stunning uh, how rapidly aggregate human behavior has changed in the, this past year. Uh, I remember like in April, I think there was a, a photo essay that showed cities around the world during the height of all the lockdowns that were occurring. It was just shocking to look at these wonderful spaces that were built for the purpose of bringing people together, being empty. Mm -hmm. How strange they look without people mixing and mingling and going about their business in these spaces. Um, it's, it's, it's just, you know, and of course, What's also amazing about it is, um, you know, the degree to which human beings can, the, the sort of emergent forces that come from every human being deciding how to behave based on their best information about what they need to do to stay safe. Uh, it's, uh, it's amazing, you know, if you think about the connection between ideas, culture, group behavior, and geologic scale effects that humans have. I mean, we're living through examples of that right now that I think um, uh, are just amazing to incorporate into our consciousness. Absolutely. And I mean, I think people are just becoming a lot more aware, like you said, of the built environment, you know, because it's now novel to go into a new building that's not your house, right? So I think people are processing the impact that I mean, on top of everything with um, climate change, I mean, people are kind of processing how we inhabit the world in a different way. Um, I think I've a lot less fossil fuel, you know, talking. You know, well, uh, I'm a member of the European Association of Archaeologists, and their, their annual meeting was virtual this year. Uh, it was supposed to be in the Czech Republic. I, no, it was supposed to be in Hungary, excuse me, but it was done virtually. And I burned a lot less fossil fuel participating in that meeting from my house than it would have if I had flown there. Of course, it would have been wonderful <laughs> to go to Budapest and, and, you know, see these wonderful buildings and wonderful places and, and uh, expand my own horizons and travel. Um, but I did more to save the planet by, by doing it on Zoom. So there's, there's so many interesting things to think about um, as we try to find other ways of doing things. Um, and, you know, I suspect that in the end, uh, it will make a big change on the overall patterns of how we live. Um, and I think it will help. I think it will help. I think, you know, I think it will help us learn how to live a bit more humbly in the earth. Hopefully, yeah. Um, so how, I mean, the pandemic will obviously change the way that humans interact with the earth, like you said, but do you see it having any long-term impacts on the way archaeology or anthropology is practiced? Well, as I said, um, having the experience of figuring out other ways to connect with people besides being in the same space, I think I think that will continue to reverberate. Um, the opportunity to have collaboration meetings remotely as opposed to flying to a spot. I mean, I would say it's kind of hard to establish, although, you know, I say this and I, I'm not sure it's true now that I say it. So for example, I uh, started a collaboration with a scholar that I had met once at a conference uh, using Slack, you know, uh, during the height of the pandemic. and. I actually feel like we've become kind of good friends and, and uh, built, built a level of trust that seems pretty similar to what would happen if you were meeting face to face. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I actually think it's kind of open how much travel will, for the purpose of scientific uh, research type interactions, will come back versus not. I think that's a really interesting question. Um, I also think, you know, one of the things I've realized is, uh, you know, before COVID, I used to think a lot about bringing guest speakers to my classes uh, at CU Boulder, and it involved either driving or planes and hotels and all these other things. And 
you know, well, you can click a few buttons and say class is remote today and bring someone from anywhere in the world to uh, share their, share what they know with your class. I mean, that's, that's kind of a, it's like it was already there, but it wasn't kind of presented as a real alternative. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think now it is. Um, and so I actually think that dimension of remote learning might make education better um, following the pandemic than it is now. Um, in the sense that there's some topics where, you know, I could be as eloquent as I can, but I still couldn't replace the authenticity of, you know, a tribal member from a, from a Pueblo uh, sharing their experiences with, and, and, and in terms of sharing the message and importance of um, cultural diversity for the world today, for example. I mean, uh, a tribal person can do that better than me, you know, no matter what I do. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think we're discovering what the advantages of the, the new ways we've been forced to deal with, uh, what those advantages are. And um, I expect it to be factored into how we do things in the future. Absolutely. And I mean, the impact on higher education is a whole other conversation. But um, I mean, I think in the past, having people zoom into your class was just kind of seen as a lesser form of engagement when you just have to think a little bit differently about it, maybe configure it a little differently, but it has a very similar level of value. And I mean, you don't have to be in the same room with someone to have that st a student really have something click in their brain, you know? Mm -hmm. so. At the, uh, at this uh, conference that I attended, you know, something that was really interesting was that um, in, when when uh, when someone is giving a presentation, there's a chat function, you know, along the side of the screen, and uh, I actually found at this conference that the speakers got far more questions through the chat function than they would ever get at a live conference where there was an audience in a dark room and you had to list, raise your hand and you know and so on. And the other thing that was so interesting is that because people had the opportunity to write their question right when it came up uh, during the present during someone's presentation. The questions were better formed and more um, incisive than they would be if you had to remember your question for 20 minutes and then try to bring it back up again. Mm -hmm. um, so there are certain elements of that, the kinds of scientific interactions that happened at that conference that I actually think were really promising. Yeah, yeah. I've seen also some um, with live lectures online, people, um, different participants chatting with each other, you know, and forming partnerships and potential projects in the chat box, you know, and that's really exciting to see too, um, mm -hmm. which wouldn't happen in a normal conference structure. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it's, um, I would say that the social media technology, you know, it is sort of fracturing our consciousnesses in the sense that we are often putting a portion of our processing ability towards several different things at once, you know, listening, listening to the speaker on screen, reading the chats, seeing your push notifications come up about important emails at the same time, all these things happening. Um, and, you know, maybe the future is for those who are naturally better at doing that, you know, being effective when a portion of their brain is doing multitasking, multitasking cognitive functions at the same time. Uh, I don't know, you know, evolution continues, I suppose. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, I guess that's a good place to end it. Is there anything else that you'd like to chat about? Uh, no, I've enjoyed it very much. Um, thanks for, thanks for um, documenting this time and the experiences of people living through it. Um, you know, uh, so many things happen in, daily, in our lives all the time that pass by and that we think about as being important, but they're not marked or documented or recorded and then they go by and there's always a sort of erosion of that memory, you know, because it's not captured. So I think the museum's efforts to capture this moment in time and share it with people will, will help us to learn from the experiences and, and, uh, and carry, carry this information with us in the future. So it's really great. Good. Good. Um, so thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, and as Scott mentioned earlier, if you want to hear more about the nitty gritty of his current archaeological research, um, check out SAR's YouTube channel for a recording of a lecture that he did.